<laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> now you're good. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> so let me just start from the beginning here. Uh, sorry for that. I had muted all and I muted myself at the same time. So uh, welcome to this morning's edition of Tech Tuesday. Uh, my name is Jeff Berger from Loy Instrument. Uh, this is our second edition. Uh, last week we talked about flame rods. Uh, today we're going to go into UV detection. We do offer a, a full day training class on combustion flame safety uh, at each one of our offices in Cleveland, Fort Wayne, as well as uh, down in Indianapolis. So if you want more details on that, you can contact Roger Stevens or myself and we can get you information on that full day class. So um, warm up your coffee and let's get started on the uh, Tech Tuesday and the UV detection. We're gonna go ahead and move into our uh, slide presentation here. Uh, as you know, last week when we were going over flame rods, uh, we do have some flame characteristics that will allow us to detect flame in a combustion system uh, for a safe, to complete a safety circuit. Um, the very top one, we talked about production of heat. Obviously, bimetal and thermocouples can be used to detect flame uh, or the heat in the flame. These are typically used for smaller systems, uh, air makeup units, uh, maybe smaller ones, uh, uh, your furnace, uh, also your hot water heater. Uh, these typically would use the thermocouple or thermal pile to detect there is a flame present. Uh, we have expansion of gases, pro uh, byproducts uh, uh, with the combustion system. Both of these uh, can be sensed, but uh, typically uh, comes at a price premium. Uh, so those aren't usually widely used in the, um, in the combustion industry. Emissions of light, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, we know that the flame can produce infrared. Uh, you can also use a photocell or UV detector. Today we're going to talk more about the UV detector. Ionization of the atmosphere in and around the flame. Uh, that's your flame rod. Uh, we discussed that last week. And um, we also have posted uh, the, each one of these sessions. Uh, we will send a link out to each one of you where you can actually log in through the Loy Instrument website to get to uh, a channel that has all of these classes on there as well for you to view later on. So optical detectors. The optical detectors include visible light, infrared, and ultraviolet. Uh, each one of these are applied to different applications. Uh, visible light is typically used for oil applications. Um, typically on small boiler applications or commercial boilers. Uh, if, you, if you've heard of the name Beckett or Beckett Gas, uh, they produce a line of burners that use uh, visible light detectors, primarily for oil only. The infrared detectors can, um, can be used in gas or oil applications, uh, but it comes with some drawbacks. The, the infrared detectors um, can have uh, interference with an inductive loads, uh, capacitance, so you have to make sure that the wires are run in separate conduit from high voltage. Uh, they can also sense uh, refractory, hot refractory when you have uh, smoke and uh, other debris flickering in front, of the, uh, in front of the infrared detector, making it think that there's a flame present when there's not. Um, but infrared detectors are very uh, widely used in uh, large boiler applications uh, that have uh, both firing on oil and gas. Uh, so uh, in those applications, infrared detectors work very well. Uh, the ultraviolet detectors, which we're going to talk about today, uh, is both uh, gas and oil applications, although in, in most cases uh, it uh, works very well in, in natural gas uh, burner applications. So let's go a little bit uh, further here and talk about ultraviolet detectors. Uh, most manufacturers have ultraviolet detectors, so uh, whether it's uh, FireEye, Honeywell, uh, any other brand, they typically carry a, a line of UV detectors. If we take a look at this optical spectrum here on, uh, on wavelengths of, um, uh, that's emitted from the flame, down here on the bottom where you see the ultraviolet, we're looking at 0.2 to 0.4 wavelengths or microns 
uh, where we're sensing the ultraviolet light that's being radiated off of the flame. Uh, so you can see here that the purple line represents gas and the, uh, or the red or pink line here represents the oil flame. So both of these are, are very, uh, uh, you know, the ultraviolet can be sensed on, on both of these flames here. Um, the, uh, typically, you're not going to have anything that uh, is radiating ultraviolet light from refractory unless you get above 2500 to 2800 degrees then you can have some instances where the uh, refractory will uh, show you some ultraviolet light but uh, typically down here you have very low interference uh, from other uh, uv sources uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some other uv sources that you could have down at this lower end uh, and ways to minimize the, um, the infraction of the uh, ultraviolet onto the UV detector. So let's talk a little bit more about how the UV detector works. Uh, inside the UV detector, there is a tube. Uh, this tube is a uh, quartz tube and it's filled with a gas inside the tube and an inert gas. This, uh, the reason why this is a quartz tube versus a glass tube is because glass actually reflects UV light. So in the Honeywell world, they, they make this out of the quartz tube. Uh, and still up in Minneapolis, these tubes are hand blown, uh, which is kind of a crazy uh, manufacturing process, but they found over the years of manufacturing these tubes that they could not reproduce uh, the quality that they would get out of uh, a hand blown tube uh, on the manufacturing line. So if you ever get a chance to go up to Minneapolis and visit the factory, it's a pretty neat process to see. Inside of this tube, you have a cathode and an anode. Uh, connected to this tube, you have a uh, F and G lead. So you have two wires that's going out that'll connect up to your RM7800 or other uh, wiring base from another manufacturer. When uh, the UV light uh, shines on the tip of this tube here and a high voltage around 200, 220 volts uh, is imposed on the cathode, the, the area around the cathode becomes ionized and electrons are able to pass from the cathode to the anode, which completes the circuit inside of that tube. Once this happens, this is known as the tube is firing. So if you ever hear that term firing, that means that um, you're in a position where the tube is seeing some UV light and it's passing that voltage through from the cathode to the anode. Uh, Typically, you can actually take these tubes off of the process, uh, which is connected usually with a half inch NPT fitting here. You can unscrew it from the process. And if you look down right through the site, um, right through the tip of the tube here, if you see a red glowing uh, mesh uh, membrane inside of this tube, that means that the tube is firing and it's actually seeing UV light. Now, in, in all UV tubes or UV uh, sensing tubes in the industry, they can fail in the unsafe condition, which means they can fail in the on condition. The only time that the uh, UV tube is, is doing a, a check of itself or a check of the circuitry is when you shut down the flame relay and you start the flame relay back up. That's known as a safe start check or a self check which actually would check to make sure that the tube is not firing and thinking that it's seeing a flame when it's not supposed to. So later on in this uh, training this morning, we'll talk a little bit about some ways to use UV detection in a uh, continuous application and what type of tube to use. Uh, but in this instance, this is just a, um, a single tube. Um, there's no self-checking or anything like that in, involved in it. So on these type of applications where you're using a uh, like a C7027 or a C7035 from Honeywell, you have to make sure that you at least shut down once every 24 hours to make sure that you do not have a runaway tube. The, uh, the other state that this tube will go into is known as a quench. So once the voltage is applied to the cathode, and you get the ionization effect with the UV hitting the top of the tube and it continues to the anode. Once the voltage is applied, it basically goes into a quench state and it drops the voltage 
and uh, it looks for an off transition. So this tube is actually firing from an on to an off transition the entire time it's actually looking at the UV light. You can't see it with the naked eye because it moves pretty quick, um, but that's the transition that's happening. So in the positive part of the uh, sine wave, you're looking at UV light, and in the negative part, you're, you're not. So it's a pretty quick transition. The ultraviolet detector um, has to be married up with the correct uh, amplifier in order for the circuitry to operate. In the Honeywell world, you have to have a purple or uh, UV ultraviolet flame amplifier. Uh, the amplifier is plugged into the, bo uh, the bottom of the RM7800 series flame relay. At the very top of this amplifier, it has a positive and negative port so that you can actually hook up a uh, voltmeter if you needed to, to check to make sure that the flame strength is uh, at the appropriate level to keep the uh, flame relay pulled in. This threshold is 1.25 volts DC. So if you're going below 1.25 volts DC at three seconds, you will drop out that flame relay and you'll lock out the flame relay for a reset. So that is one way to check your, um, your voltage coming into the uh, flame relay, is just plug in your uh, uh, voltmeter there. The, the signal, the microamp signal um, from, the, uh, from the F lead coming in is typically around two to four microamps. Um, that's typically the level that you'll see, but in most applications, uh, if they have a newer flame safeguard system, there's, there should be a port either on the flame relay itself or the amplifier, which would actually be able to show you the flame strength. The, uh, in the Honeywell world, the C7027 is known as a <clears throat> purple peeper. Uh, so uh, it has a purple coating on the outside of the, uh, the tube itself. And uh, there's also another one called a C7035, which is a, a, a UV tube that actually lets you replace the tube. So you can take the shielding off, replace the tube if you have a bad tube and continue running. The, the mini peeper, the C7027 is basically a, a throwaway tube if it does fail. <clears throat> At the top of the uh, UV tube where you connect it to the process with this uh, NPT fitting, <clears throat> the, uh, the maximum temperature that the tube wants to see is about 215 degrees. If you do have an application where the, the tip of the tube is reaching higher than that, there is a couple things that you can do to prevent that. There is a heat block that you can get as an accessory that will protect that tube from seeing those high temperatures, or you can add an additional sight pipe, which will extend the distance from the uh, NPT connection to the burner uh, casting, so it'll move it further away from the burner and the temperatures that it's seeing there on the, on the uh, top of that tube. The other thing that you want to make sure of is on these UV tubes is that you keep the uh, UV window uh, clean from debris and oil. Um, if you get debris or buildup of moisture on the top of that tube, uh, you will get very low uh, flame signal strength. So you want to make sure that you do some preventive maintenance and keep that clear of debris. Um, a good way of doing that is a couple ways. <clears throat> make sure that the uh, C7027 or the uh, UV detector is on an angle, which uh, angles down to the, the burner so that if there's any debris that actually gets filled up in the pipe or that connection to the UV tube, it, it will fall out into the, uh, the burner chamber. The other way is uh, you can actually put a purge air if you wanted to, a NPT connection between the UV tube and the uh, burner chamber and uh, offer some purge air to keep that debris out of the front of the lens as well. <clears throat> Let's talk about some uh, UV sources that can uh, rave havoc on a UV tube. <clears throat> One of the things that we talked about earlier was hot refractory. So anytime you get above about 2,500 degrees, you can see uh, UV radiation coming off of hot refractory. Uh, <clears throat> spark ignition 
spark ignition is another big thing that can um, uh, impose UV on the detector itself. And we're going to go into some ways to mitigate that UV uh, imposing on the UV tube because that is that is one thing that um, most people will see when they're putting in a, a UV tube with a flame relay. Um, one of the things that you'll see happening on most applications is that once you go to start up the burner system and it's going through its purge and it's getting ready to go ahead and light the pilot or light the main off of a spark, immediately you'll see a voltage spike on the flame relay and it will shut the system down. So that typically means that it's sensing a spark and sensing UV off the spark and it thinks that there's a flame present when there's not. And uh, as soon as that happens, it, uh, it'll shut everything down. The, uh, the other thing is uh, that can impose UV light is gas lasers, uh, uh, sun lamps, bright flashlights, uh, gamma and x-rays. Uh, the x-rays typically, if you have a customer that has piping uh, throughout their plant where they have to do um, you know, x-rays of the pipe to see if there's you know, any cracks and stuff like that in high pressure pipes, um, if that's happening anywhere around the uh, UV detector and the flame relay system, uh, <clears throat> X-rays can actually uh, impose UV light onto a uh, UV detector. The big one that I'm usually seeing though is, is spark interference. So we'll get into a little bit more of that and how to uh, minimize spark interference on a UV. The, uh, some of the requirements uh, with applying the UV detector, um, let's just go through those here real quick. Uh, the detector must have an un unobstructed view of the flame. Uh, so obviously, um, the proper way to really sight a UV detector on a flame is to have it on an angle and sensing probably the first 30% of the flame. That's typically where the most UV is generated out of a flame. So proper sighting is very, very important. On most burners nowadays, uh, they, they already have the ports set for UV detectors. Um, and they, they usually try to pick the most optimal uh, area in order to place that UV detector on the burner itself. But uh, there are applications where you'll have to cite that manually and uh, just know that you typically want a pretty good angle of covering about the first 30% of the flame to detect good UV light. Um, second, the detector must not see spark. So one of the ways that uh, in the Honeywell world, the one of the ways that that's minimized is by using a half wave spark generator, which is a Q624 uh, spark generator. And what this is doing is, as earlier I, when I talked about firing and quenching on the UV tube, when the UV tube is firing, the Q624 spark generator is not, it is not uh, generating a spark. When you're on the quenching side, the Q624 is actually emitting a spark. So what this does is it flips where you're, where you're sensing flame and when you're generating a spark, and that minimizes all spark interference. As long as you have the, white, the correct wiring back to the flame relay, um, that minimizes any spark that you might be uh, getting as interference. Uh, third, the detector must be protected from excess temperatures. We talked about that. Typically 215 degrees is the highest that you want to see on a uh, UV detector. Um, going back a little bit, uh, we talked a little bit about infrared. Infrared is typically around 125 degrees F. So uh, again, if you have an application which has higher temperatures uh, going through the pipe or through the site pipe to the, the detector, uh, UV detectors are probably better for that application versus IR, just from a standpoint of that ambient temperature needs to be a little bit lower on the IR application. Um, obviously, last but not least, you have to have correct wiring procedures uh, back to the flame relay. Uh, on a UV detector, uh, typically number 14 wire, uh, you, you usually don't want to go over, you know, 200 foot. Um, if you do go over 200 foot, there are amplifiers that will help boost that signal, but you could get applications where you might see a lower flame strength uh, when you have runs greater than uh, 200 foot. 
So steps to eliminate spark interference. Uh, again, this is the most common thing that you're gonna see on UV detectors, picking up that spark. Uh, you could use a halfway spark igniter, which is the Q624. Uh, the other method is uh, using a black iron sight pipe. So if you have the UV detector mounted directly up to the casting on the burner and you're picking up spark interference, if you were to add a black sight pipe and extend the top of that UV tube away from the casting, what that does is it starts minimizing the view of what you're seeing on UV uh, from the flame. And what that sometimes will do is it'll take that just enough of that spark interference away from the top of the UV tube and, and minimize uh, any UV that's uh, being shown by that uh, spark igniter. So adding in a black iron sight pipe and extending it away from the burner casting, that's uh, one way to restrict the interference. Uh, thirdly, restrict the detector's viewing angle by using a longer sight pipe that we just talked about. Um, you can also add in an orifice inside of that tube, uh, which would again reduce the viewing angle or reduce the viewing uh, of the UV coming off of the flame um, so that you could uh, uh, get away with the spark interference. So those are three ways to be able to uh, restrict the spark uh, UV and uh, should help you out in the future. Proper viewing angle is very critical like we talked about. Um, you never want the detector as shown above viewing stri uh, straight down at the flame. Uh, as you can see, you have a very, very short window there of UV detection when you're doing that. Um, you will also run into um, uh, problems if you're using a self-checking detector and you mount it in this fashion, which we'll talk a little bit about here in the next couple minutes. Um, if you're using a, um, a mini peeper or a C7035 UV detector, the proper angle is coming in through the side of the burner at an angle where you're picking up about the first 30% of the flame, which is emitting a lot of UV light in that area. Optic optical detector application checkout. So for each one of the detectors, whether it's IR, UV, photocell, there are some tests that you have to do when you're starting up the system to make sure that um, it's properly, properly sighting the UV off the flame. Um, the one, the two down at the bottom, which is ignition spark interference, which we talked about, uh, is one test that you wanna do. The other is the pilot turndown test. Um, so on the spark interference test, what you're going to do is you're going to shut off the main uh, gas supply to the uh, gas train. You're going to reset the flame relay. You're going to start it up. And before you get to the pilot or main ignition, obviously your spark's going to come on. At that point, you're going to hook up your digital voltmeter to the amplifier, or if you have a, a display uh, which reads the flame signal, you'll want to take a look at either one of those and make sure that you're not picking up the UV off the spark. That's the, really the easiest way to, to check for that spark interference uh, when you're installing a new system or if it's an older system that you're doing some checkout on and you need to, need to find out if you're getting that type of response. The pilot turndown test is another uh, critical one as well. If you have a system that has uh, a pilot, you're running off a pilot um, to establish your main flame, you'll want to make sure that you do a pilot turndown test. So uh, you turn down the pilot and make sure that you're getting a good UV uh, source um, during that time that the pilot is, is, uh, is burning. In applications, uh, as I talked about, if you're running more than 24 hour operations continuously, uh, these would be typically uh, maybe large furnaces, uh, maybe large uh, uh, boilers that run for continuous operations. For those applications, uh, NFPA recommends that uh, you go back to the recommendations of the vendor that are the manufacturer of that device. Uh, in the Honeywell world, uh, that is, uh, they do recommend that you use a self-checking detector. Um, so on the left-hand side, uh, this is the uh, C7012 or C7061 Honeywell UV detector. It's got a big purple can on the outside of it. Uh, 
Um, inside of this, there is a, a power tube, just like the C7027, that uh, has a shutter that flickers in front of that tube. And every uh, couple seconds, it will pulse in front of that tube, and it will make sure that the, uh, the tube is not sensing UV light. Um, at that point, the flame relay, the amplifier understands that it's not supposed to be sensing UV light and will actually shut it down if you have a runaway condition. So in applications, again, if you're running more than 24 hours, we recommend that you use a self-checking detector. Um, the only time uh, on the mini peeper or the smaller UV detectors that is checking for a runaway condition is if you shut down the system and then power the system back up. And at that point, it will check to make sure that there's no flame present. So um, the, uh, on the purple peeper, the, uh, the self-checking scanner here, the, the big purple can, uh, there are some limitations on the way, the way that uh, you can wire this. Uh, let's see. screen here that shows that. On the uh, self-checking detector, it will actually, um, you have to have it mounted in a fashion, anything off of uh, straight up and down horizontal. So anything 90 degrees from horizontal is how you have to have that uh, mounted. And it's pretty critical because that uh, shutter in the can there actually works off of uh, uh, gravitation there so it's when it's opening and closing it's less stress if it's mounted in a, in one of these fashions off of 90 degrees uh, versus straight up or down and there is an arrow on the bottom of it as well that will actually show you um, where you need to be mounted it uh, the arrow should be pointing straight down again these detectors are the c7012 the c7061 the only difference, and I talked a little bit about the amplifiers, the only difference um, on the self-checking detectors where you would use something other than a UV amplifier that is purple would be if you use a C7012, which is an older style tube design uh, self-checking detector. In those applications, you actually use a green rectification amplifier, which is an R7847. So let's wrap this up here by going through just some uh, flame safety uh, general rules of thumb. Um, the flame safeguard that you're using must perform a safe start check. Uh, this is a check to make sure that you do not have a runaway condition at the beginning of a startup of your flame safety system. Uh, the systems that run more than 24 hours, you must have self-checking flame detector and the flame response timing on your amplifier needs to be four seconds or less. In the Honeywell world, it's three seconds or less. You have a choice between a three second amplifier and a 0.8 second amplifier. All right, with that, uh, we're wrapping up here in 30 minutes. So I wanna keep the, uh, keep the time to what we committed here to. Um, at this point, I will take uh, questions that you might have here from the audience and uh, Go through some of those. So if you want to unmute your mic and answer, uh, ask the question, we can go from there. So what I do, just get out of it. <laughs> All right. Um, so if we don't have any questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Uh, next week's session is going to be on uh, single loop controllers. Uh, these are uh, process controllers for uh, level, flow, temperature, uh, high temperature applications. We're going to go through the Honeywell UDC product line um, and go through some general troubleshooting and, and programming of those instruments. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to log in next week, we'd love to have you. Um, other than that, we'll go ahead and wrap up today. Uh, thanks again for uh, joining us, and uh, I look forward to talking to you here in the future. And at this point, I need to warm up my coffee. I just ran through my cup of coffee here pretty quick. So 
Go warm up your coffee and from our home to your business, thanks for your time today.